Hello everyone, I'm Anthony Painter, the RSA's Chief Research and Impact Officer, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to today's RSA Thursday lunchtime event. Uh, I can't wait to get stuck into our conversation today because, as you're no doubt aware, the panellists sat beside me virtually really are some of the UK's leading experts uh, thinking and writing about inequality and poverty today. So thank you so, so much for taking the time to join us, Helen Barnard, Kate Pickett and Stuart Lansley. Uh, I'll introduce you all in detail individually in a little bit, um, but a very big welcome to you all now. Thank you for joining us this lunchtime. Um, we need our panels cancelled today more than ever um, because the pandemic has only exacerbated the already intolerable gulf between those in our society who have the least and those who have the most. And if you're interested to know more about the forces that set all this in motion, Stuart's new book, the publication of which draws us all together today, is a fantastic primer on the 200 year history of inequality and poverty in Britain. The book, The Richer, The Poorer, How Britain Enriched the Few and Failed the Poor, shows how for 200 years, powerful elites have become enriched alongside surging inequality, mass poverty and weakened social resilience. Uh, we'll post some of the links about the book into the YouTube chat and you can also find it on the event webpage. Also, if you're interested in finding out more about the RSA's work on economic insecurity, please do check out the links in the YouTube chat. And please do get involved in the conversation on Twitter throughout the conversation using a hashtag RSA inequality. And we're really looking forward to hearing from you all. But before you rush and do all that, let's get started. Um, we're going to hear some very short scene testing statements from each of our panelists in turn, uh, and then we'll have a conversation together. So first up, it's my real pleasure to introduce Stuart Lansley. Stuart is a visiting fellow at the University of Bristol School of Policy Studies, and he is author of a number of books, including Breadline Britain and The Cost of Inequality. He's a council member of the Progressive Economy Forum, a fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences, and a member of the National Advisory Panel of CLASS. Stuart, it's fantastic to have you here today. Welcome and over to you. Well, I mean, a huge thanks to RSA for hosting uh, this debate. I, I mean, you know, I, I mean, on one of the big issues of the time as to whether uh, we can and are going to uh, build a better post-COVID society. Uh, now, one of the tests of whether we succeed in that must be that we reduce the current le heightened levels of inequality and poverty. There's been an interesting debate in the press in the last few weeks about uh, comparing today with the 1970s. Now, they, the, you know, both these periods have been, were, have been turbulent, uh, but the 1970s has one very important distinction, uh, which is that it, it had this remarkable historical achievement of, ha of being the high point for equality and a low point for poverty. Uh, uh, it, this was very short-lived, and we've never actually done better than in the 1970s. Um, it, it, it's, it's no coincidence if, if we look at the sort of indicators of, of, of well-being today, there are more food banks in the UK than there are branches of Greg's. Uh, the, 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 the top tenth of wealth holders in Britain hold 10 times as much wealth as the bottom 40% altogether. Uh, the, the values of the Victorian poor law, you know, which was coercive and harsh and mean, have had as much influence in the last few decades as William Be Beveridge's uh, values of uh, more progressive values of universalism uh, a a and uh, generosity. So um, th th we are in effect living through a high inequality, high poverty wave that's been going for 40 years and shows uh, no sign of uh, abatement. Now, now, why is it that we've, that we've um, had this great surge in inequality uh, in the last 40 years? Why is it that uh, nearly one in three children uh, are in poverty on the official definition today? That's more than double. That's more than double the level in the 1970s. And I think there are two main reasons. The first one is that egalitarians kind of lost the argument, lost the battle of ideas 
uh, in the 1970s, early 1980s, and they've never, we never won it back. Um, and related to that is that in the 1980s, this sort of counter economic counter-revolution that took place, um, uh, which tried to dismantle parts of the social democratic agenda, um, had at its heart the idea that inequality was a good thing. We needed more inequality, more rewards at the top to build greater prosperity. Well, uh, it hasn't worked. You know, we, we've had the higher inequality, but we haven't had the economic gains that go with it. What's being created is a model of extractive capitalism, uh, by which a small elite of financiers and, 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 and corporate bosses have been able to secure a disproportionate size of the cake uh, using methods uh, that have had negative impact for the rest of society, negative impact on wages, working conditions, small suppliers, and taxpayers. Now, what's really, what Britain has as part of this big high inequality, high inequality stuff, is an economic and social bias to inequality. Uh, I've called it sort of leveling up at the top, created by leveling down uh, at the bottom. Now, all societies, all civilized societies need to justify their inequalities. And it's very difficult to find a defense for the current levels of inequality and poverty, theoretically or in terms of, uh, in terms of empirical evidence. So uh, the, the moral case, is it right that, 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 that large numbers are able to earn more in a month or, or even less than the majority of the population earn in a lifetime. Uh, the economic, there's an, a strong economic case against inequality. The evidence is absolutely overwhelming that levels of inequality at, at present levels have been the source of the economic instability of the last few years. Um, so um, the, 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 if we are to create a better society, uh, we must tackle these, this level of inequality, which is the source of so many problems in society, uh, weakening democracy, many of our social ills, the loss of uh, the, the, the reduction in, in, in social resilience in many communities. Uh, and, and to do so, what we need is a program of reform that uh, eliminates the inequality bias and creates new uh, equality instruments. And in order to do that, we need a kind of transformative program, different from, but akin to what happened in, in 1945. We, we need, in essence, a 1945 moment. Uh, and, and as uh, William Beveridge uh, said in his re 1942 report, which helped launch the post-war welfare state, the time is not for patching. Thank you. Thank you, Stuart. Uh, a, a bracing and passionate call to arms to kick us off uh, today. And next up, uh, we're delighted to be joined by um, Helen Barnard. Helen is Associate Director of the Joseph Rentree Foundation, uh, one of the leading organisations working on tackling poverty um, in the UK, so I might say the leading, um, and the Research and Policy Director of Pro Bono um, Economics. Um, Helen has worked across policy and analysis at JRF, and from April 20 to mid 2021, she led the organization as director. She built the first iteration of JRF's monitoring and analysis team, examining the key social, economic, and public policy trends and changes affecting people and places in poverty. It's wonderful to have you here today, Helen, and over to you. Thanks, Anthony, and thanks, Stuart, for writing such a thought-provoking book for our discussion today. So I think when I've been looking at the pandemic, the image that I've had from the beginning has been the idea that we're all being caught up in the same storm, but the experiences we've had have been enormously difficult because we've been in different boats. And I think one of the things that keep come, keeps coming back to me is that this isn't only about the experiences of the kind of uber wealthy versus the rest of us. It is as much about the difference in experience between the big group in the middle of our society and the bottom 20% or so. And that has been quite a lot of the inequality that we've seen and we've seen growing. And for me, that is one of the reasons it is so challenging to tackle inequality 
is because we need to redesign systems that, as Stuart said, do massively benefit the very, very wealthy. But actually, they also bring immediate benefits to many people in the middle of society who will not think of themselves as being particularly wealthy or privileged. So if you look at the economic impacts of the pandemic, uh, there is a large group of people who came into the pandemic in secure jobs that they could do from home, living in decently sized homes that they own. And whilst, of course, people have experienced terrible loss and difficulty, economically, many of those people have actually come out of the pandemic in a really good way. You know, they have built up savings. They are coming out with more security. Whereas there is the group at the bottom who came in either out of work or in low paid and insecure jobs. And those people have borne the brunt of both the risk if they're working out in the community or of job losses. They have run down savings. They have run up debt. They have gone without essentials. They are coming out of the pandemic in a much even worse position than they came in. Now, we did, though, it's worth saying we saw unprecedented government help. So particularly the boost to universal credit that the government made very early on. That was more than I think any of us in this territory had thought was remotely feasible pre-pandemic. Now, of course, what we see is the Chancellor trying to rein in spending. He wants to go back to his political base as a low tax conservative. But what I found really striking in the enormous effort that went into pre the last budget, holding on to that universal credit boost, is the breadth of support and the, the number of people from across the political spectrum who came out batting for social security as a positive good. Now, I don't think I've seen that kind of coalition and discussion uh, actually ever in my, in my time working on this. Now that we didn't get everything we wanted, but we did get the Chancellor to put three billion pounds of permanent spending into Social Security. Now, again, that is more than any of us were trying for in the budgets coming up for the pandemic. What we failed to do was secure the support that was desperately needed for people out of work. That's a much bigger mountain to climb. But I think the last thing I say is I think we sometimes fall into the trap of thinking that we should focus all of our energy on Social Security as the way to prevent poverty. And we need to do more to challenge some of the other systems, which mean Social Security has to do so much heavy lifting. And that brings me back to my last point about why it's so challenging to reduce inequality, because many of those systems benefit people in the middle, large groups of people. So if you take housing, you know, we have a housing system which shuts out a bunch of people at the bottom from having a home that they can afford, that is safe, that is a decent place to live. And, you know, we, what we need to do immediately is build social housing and reform the right to buy system. But actually, the political imperative to make sure house prices keep rising and to view any fall in house prices as a catastrophe, that obviously it is partly about the uber wealthy. It's actually mostly because enormous numbers of voters will panic if they see their house price starting to go down. And that means that there is a constant pumping up of the demand for housing. Now, winning that battle, convincing, you know, Middle England that it's actually OK if your house price doesn't rise a lot. That is an enormous battle to win. And similarly with the labour market, we need to improve rights at the bottom of the labour market. But that is it's, that is going to affect not just big corporations with bosses that it's easy to hate and it's easy to say, look, you know, you guys are rich, you make lots of money. Most people don't work for those corporations. They don't work for Sports Direct. They work for small, medium sized companies, myriad across the country on tight margins. Nobody is getting rich. It is all those businesses that will have to change. And what that means is that I think to properly tackle inequality, we need to have a conversation with the public, which is about changes that will affect most of them, as well as changes that will affect that small group at the top. We need to do both. But I think that even when we've been successful in tackling poverty, we have often done remarkably badly at talking to the public in ways they can connect with about the changes we need to see in systems that they currently do quite well out of. And I think that is a very hard thing to do, but it's what we have to do to secure sustainable change that won't be reversed the next time you get a change in government. Brilliant, thank you, um, uh, Helen. 
So these these sort of densely bound interlocking systems are critical, and we'll come back to that. And obviously, despite recent um, significant successes, for example, on the Universal Credit campaign, there are still these political headwinds, which I'll also come back to later on in, in, in the conversation. And, and finally, we're thrilled to be joined by Professor Kate Pickett. Kate Pickett is Professor of Epidemiology and Deputy Director of the Centre for Future Health at the University of York. Uh, she's co-author with Richard Wilkinson of the landmark text, The Spirit Level and The Inner Level, and is co-founder and patron of the Equality Trust, trustee of the Wellbeing Economy Alliance, and was chair of the Greater Manchester Independent Inequalities Commission in 2020 to 2021. Thank you so much for being here, Kate, and over to you. Thank you. Thanks for the introduction. And um, like Helen, I'd like to thank Stuart for writing such an excellent history of inequality in this country and, and his eloquent exposition of, of why it's so important. I mean, I think we have such a robust and such a growing uh, body of evidence about the impact of inequality. You know, we wrote Spirit Level in, in, well, it was published in 2009, but since that, the evidence has been growing and growing about the impact on health, the impact on well being and social relationships. Um, the impact on the economy and how hard it makes it to tackle poverty if you don't tackle inequality first. Um, these are evidentially causal relationships. We know they are and we know how they work. You know, we know how the biology of chronic stress explains the health impacts and how that arises from the um, comparisons, the status anxieties that inequality imposes on us. So we know so much. We've got so much evidence that we can work with. And yet we went into that COVID, the COVID pandemic so vulnerable because of our inequalities. We had had a whole decade of austerity, um, making health inequalities worse, making inequality worse. And that was despite having things like the Marmot Review on Health Inequalities, Government Commission that came out in 2010, our work as well, showing how important it was for health and well-being to do something about inequality. And yet nothing was done. Instead, we had a decade of austerity. And so we entered the COVID-19 pandemic much more vulnerable than we should have been. We had far more workers on low pay and in precarious positions who couldn't shield. Um, and if you were on furlough, 80% of only just getting by wasn't enough. Um, we had too much overcrowding in, in housing. We had too many people with comorbid conditions. And so it's not surprising that we had a completely unequal pandemic. And Helen drew attention to you know, that idea that at the start, it was, it was spoken about as if it was an equal opportunity disease, you know, that we were all in it together and that, that COVID saw no class boundaries. And of course that wasn't true. Um, of course, those who suffered most, who were most likely to be exposed, most likely to be sick and most likely to be die, were those at the sharp end of poverty inequality and deprivation. Now we saw the government do quite a remarkable shift with COVID. It went from being the government that had said, you know, we really didn't have to pay attention to, to experts, to being one that said it was following the science every, every night when it stood up in front of our television cameras. And it's true that they have paid attention to some extent to the public health science that they needed to, but why weren't they paying attention? to the science and the social sciences of the previous decades that told them inequality was bad for the health of the population. Why weren't they listening to the policy experts who knew what to do about it? And it's because um, they have vested interests and they didn't want to tackle these things, not because they didn't know it was important and not because they didn't know what they should be doing about it. So if we actually want to see true levelling up and, and we have levelling up now as the government's stated agenda. And I believe that they want to prioritise that. I think that is right. But I think what they need to recognise is that inequality reduction and poverty amelioration and tackling deprivation and investing in early years and families, that is at the heart of levelling up, not building bridges and big infrastructure problem um, projects and, and giving money to the Tory towns. They need to really tackle the inequality and the poverty that are the root causes of the gaps in our society and what, what needs to be addressed. 
And that's everything from investing in early years education to tackling skills deficits, but it is about putting people at the heart of the levelling up agenda and not about just thinking about getting a faster rail line from, from one bit of the north to, to the other bit of the north. And I suppose I'll, I'll just finish by saying when we think about inequality as well, it is crucial for us having a more sustainable economy as well as an economy that is better for everybody. And we've got lots of emergencies to tackle at the moment. We have got the pandemic emergency, but we've got the climate emergency as well. And so if we're thinking about systems, and Helen talked a lot and very eloquently about that needing to change systems, we need to think about our economy as embedded in social systems and all of that embedded in nature. We need to recognize the connections between all of those things and see that reducing inequality is important for all of those different agendas. And, and that's where, where we need to be at. And, and my final thought is that um, a lot of people think that the inequality, equality debate is, is sort of ideological, that if you're on the political left, of course you're in favor of greater equality. And if you're on the right, that there's, there's some kind of attack on, on your liberty that, that needs to be sort of thought about. But this is beyond a moral issue. You know, this is an issue where we have strong evidence that most people, almost all people benefit when inequality is reduced. And so I don't think we necessarily need to worry about political agendas and moral arguments. We just need to keep convincing people of the data. And as Helen said, making, making that push to, to share with the people who can make the change or, or can tolerate change or call for change, making they, sure that they know what it is we have to do and how they will benefit as well. Brilliant. Thank you, Kate. And it's almost as if we designed this, but your, your, your closing comment segues quite beautifully into my opening question, which I kind of want to explore um, a, a little more about the relationship. And I think Helen touched on this as well, between the, the, the wealthy uh, and um, those most at the sharp end and poverty, and then before, between the middle and those in poverty as well. But starting off with the with the wealthy um, and, and putting the moral arguments to one side, which you can never do, but let's just for the purposes of the conversation do that. And going back to the points that Kate was making around the sort of unanswerable um, evidence of the link between um, inequality and poor uh, outcomes across a whole series of different uh, dimensions. The question for me is actually, how do we articulate the sense of linkage between those who most benefit from the current system and most suffer from the current system? Now, what, what are the arguments that, that can be marshaled in order to convince enough people that we are genuinely all in it together to coin a, coin a phrase? And I'll go to um, Stuart first of all on that question. I mean, that, that, that's obviously a huge issue. How on earth do we mobilise um, the public um, the political classes, the thinking classes, the commentariat um, to build a very strong case um, that, that we need to go for egalitarianism. Um, uh, there are lots of examples in history of, of how we've secured change. Um, the, 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 you know, the, the, the campaign for the national minimum wage, the campaign for the health service, for, for a national health service, the campaign uh, for child benefit and so on. Um, and I think what we need is a social, a social movement for equality. Um, uh, social, I mean, it, it needs to be bottom up and it needs to be top down. Um, the, 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 the experience of the last 30 years, if we look at some of the most successful social movements, the women's movement, the climate movement, the anti-racist movement, they have, they have, you know, they have moved policy. There's absolutely no doubt that those movements have had a big influence. Um, I don't think politicians will do anything until the public are on the warpath. Um, at the moment, the public aren't really on the warpath uh, over inequality. Um, I think partly because we don't have political leaders who are re really leading the charge. We have a lot of empty 
there's a lot of empty words. You know, uh, the Labour Party has kind of it, it's a bit silent on it, and it it it, it, it hasn't really made it. It's, you know, the, the, it equality has always been the Labour Party's prime goal, but it but it but it's kind of lost it. It's lost interest in it. it um, but, I mean, I think we've got, you know, we've really got to build a campaign. There are, there, there are, there are lots of small campaigns. Uh, there's the Equality Trust, like, uh, Child Public Action Group, etc., JRF, who are making the, 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 the case. But they're, they're, they're really talking to, you know, small groups of people, academics and, and, and campaigners and the small group. We're not reaching the, the, the wider public. I've no idea how we create a social movement, but I don't think until we have that bottom up pressure on, on the political classes, um, all we're going to get is, to, is tokenism, I suspect. Kate, what do you think? I mean, a, a, a movement obviously has had historical success in a whole series of areas, but this, this point about our fates being bound um, together, because you know, if there is a, a, you know, a, a group of people who think they're all right and the current system meets their purposes and at the top you've got a group of people who are more than all right and and also have enormous institutional power within the system whether it's in media and through politics and we've seen obviously the scandal around sort of ppe contracts whatever which which suggests actually it's, yeah. it's, it's beyond just positional it's actually institutional power as well what are the persuasive arguments that that our fates are bound together it's tough, isn't it? Because actually, I, when Stuart was speaking, I was thinking about, um, yes, we haven't got a grassroots movement on the wall path, but they're actually on the path, if not on the wall path. You know, so every time the British Social Attitudes um, survey comes out, it shows that, you know, the vast majority of the British public think that inequality is too big and should be tackled. And any time you do a survey, um, it's the same. You get, you get huge proportions in favour of um, progressive policies, and then you don't see that that translated. So I was thinking about that as he was talking and, and also his lack of leadership. And I do think that's key to painting a vision of the connectedness of um, those at the bottom with those in the middle and everybody except those at the very, very top um, for doing better with greater equality. But when I was thinking about leadership the other day and um, a group of academics in the North, we've got a report coming out tomorrow, and we wanted somebody to write a preface for it on the impact of, of, of children, um, of the pandemic on children in the North. And we were thinking, who could write that? Who's, who's shown real leadership, you know, in tackling child poverty? And it's footballers and poets. It's not, it's not our politicians. And then if you think of the climate emergency, who's, who's shown real leadership there? It's an 18-year-old Swedish girl. And so we're completely lacking in charismatic, visionary, political leadership at the top of the political structures that can actually make things happen. So that that gap is huge. And, and that's, that's who sort of needs to do that job. Because if Stuart does that job of, of joining it all together, or Helen does it, or I do it, we're, we're just small voices that, that add to an evidence base. Um, but to, to sort of galvanise everybody on the path to actually be on the war path, that takes leadership, I think, more than it takes more evidence, more statistics, more data. Um, in your opening sort of re re remarks, you, 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 you sort of looked at this sort of issue of a sort of comfortable middle versus a sort of impoverished 20 20%. Um, and I just wonder the degree to which that middle really is. Um, come from. In fact, we, we had some polling data rounds at the weekend, um, which showed sort of seven seven percent of people basically are spending more than their than, than their income every month. But thirty eight percent are just about balancing the books um, every month. And and you do wonder how you can build up an asset base, regardless of house prices, which are fairly liquid as an asset. How much you can build a sort of buffer, an asset base on on the basis of balancing the books month to month. So I wonder whether there's more economic insecurity within that middle than, than maybe first that first meets the eye um so yes definitely and particularly if you look at it generationally you can see younger generations the level of economic insecurity is far higher than it was in previous generations um, and in a sense that feeds the problem of how do you get systematic change um, because 
everybody thinks of themselves as typical and somebody you know many of many people probably many people watching this event would think of themselves as just about managing or kind of just about keeping their balance even if when you look objectively at where they sit in our distribution they are at the middle or even the higher end and that sense i think makes it very hard to convince people that we need to do a lot more about the bit of inequality which is at the bottom but i also think i mean the challenge for me i think it isn't it is about leadership it is about those things but it's about more than that it is i think there is a real problem for our movement as with a lot of others that the way that people who are who work on this stuff all the time the way that people who are caring deeply and are activists perceive the issue talk about it is radically different to how most people in the population think and talk. And there's been some really interesting research done across quite a lot of social issues, quite a lot of campaigners, uh, and I would include myself in that when we started looking at this, the way we talk about a problem quite often actively decreases support among the wider population for what we want to happen. And you have, what we, have to, we have to learn to connect with the public where they are, not where we think they should be. And just telling them they're wrong and giving them five more stats to prove they're wrong doesn't just not work. It actually makes things significantly harder. So, you know, you kind of take some of the worst policies like the benefit cap, which is a terrible policy. It's incredibly popular. You know, it polls brilliantly because it keys into something real about how the public think and how they perceive the social security system. So I actually think the movement that exists is doing a lot of good, but many of us still need to learn to talk and connect with the public in a way that doesn't make our own base happy, actually. Because if you're talking in a way that gets your base cheering, almost certainly you are alienating the people in the middle that you have to win over. And we've seen in the climate movement, really interesting critiques now from people within that movement who are saying that, that some of the ways people are campaigning is alienating the large group of people in the middle who you have to win to make big change, not just incremental change. Yeah, brilliant, Helen, thank you. And there, there's a, I mean, Kate, I think you've, you've written about this, but there's, there's, there's a couple of sort of psychological glitches that human beings have that seem to be driving some of this. One is what's called sort of moral hazard, the, the fear of the, the free ride there, which I think is why the benefits cap is so, so popular because it, it seems to put a limit on 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 that sort of free riding uh, behavior the, the second and i think sort of tawny wrote about this is about sort of acquisition and status and the drive for status you know jeff bezos flying in space and, and 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 all the rest it's kind of unstoppable there's no limits or parameters to the sort of acquisition of wealth because with it comes ever greater status and those two dynamics sort of interplay in, 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 in quite a tricky way, don't they? And, and you know, is that sort of description about right? And, and maybe we need to sort of shine a light on this a bit so we can reflect on ourselves a little more. Yeah, I think, I think that that's a really good point. You know, we're, we're still stuck, aren't we, with the legacy of greed is good and this idea that, that consumption um, demonstrates your worth and that we have to keep up and we have to display our status for other people to see because that, that's really, really important. I remember some of Polly Toynbee's work talking to the sort of super rich who think that they are just in Helen's middle, um, even though they're, you know, they're in the sort of top bit of the top 1%. And certainly I've heard other people saying, you know, that the reason that they need those vast amounts of wealth is to show that they're a little bit better than, than the people just below. And so it's, it's a never ending sort of race. But that, you know, we can't do that within planetary boundaries. We can't mm. just keep consuming and consuming to excess. And so we, so we have to tackle inequality because that, that releases that, that status pressure to some extent. You know, you don't have to spend as much on consumer goods or um, spend as much to, to try and improve your, your status if you live in a more egalitarian society where you're judged less for those things. So I think this is at the crux of the, the joining together of the inequality reduction agenda and the climate tackling the climate emergency agenda is, is dealing with the forces that drive status consumption and over-consumerism. 
and and they're tough things to challenge. I, I can't remember was it was it Marx or somebody else who said that um, people would rather have a small house that's bigger than their neighbor's house rather than a big house that's smaller than their neighbor's <laughs> house. You know, so I mean historically this it probably wasn't Marx, but it's it's been going on a long time. Um, but those pressures are less in more equal societies, and of course we're we're not in one. So it's hard for us to feel what that must feel like. Um, but that's that's the kind of issue that, that we need to tackle. Hey, a couple of times you, you, you've referenced a sort of planetary boundary um, argument and the interconnectedness between social systems, the, um, the, the economy and, and, and nature. Stuart, you, you write in your book at one point, you say that, that we're in a sort of a comfortable society in which to be rich, but not poor. I wonder how much you think that um, actually the, the, the climate emergency, climate crisis, as well as the experience of pandemic may be in the process of starting to threaten that comfort. Because even though the impacts are unequal, as we all know, there's no hiding from, from, from these sort of the, the, these global challenges and emergencies. Well, I mean, I, I, I think that there are several forces, I mean, some of them are, you know, softer than others, that uh, are beginning to penetrate, you know, um, some of the things that, that, that Kate and Helen were talking about, you know, that, I mean, there is a coalition of interest, actually, between um, lower income groups and, and middle income groups. I mean, there are certainly some conflicts, but there are also some coalitions. Uh, and, and, I mean, I think that the what people are beginning to realize is that the present system is unsustainable. It's not just, I mean, just take climate change is that I think people are beginning to accept, uh, maybe reluctantly, that the solution to climate change requires the West to consume less, that the rich world to consume less, uh, in order to let you know the, the the developing world catch up, but if you look at con, con, consuming less in the rich world like Britain, when you've got a model of uh, sort of luxury capitalism, which is what we we have, when expending and consumption is loaded to the top, um, I mean it's the top. I mean I think the figures are that the top one. I think it's the top. I can't remember if it's the top one percent or the top ten percent um, have double the resource use and therefore contribution to, to climate change uh, than the bottom half. Um, so if, you know, the, the consumption changes need to take place across the board, but mainly at the top. I mean, I, and I think people are beginning to wake up. I, mean, I think that, 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 that COVID, climate, COVID initially had a very big impact, as we know, um, upon attitudes towards uh, towards you know who contributes most to society and you know uh, you know the, it, it all got reversed didn't it you know I mean it, 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 it was delivery drivers and, uh, and 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 road sweepers and all the rest of it you know the, the lowest paid groups who making a huge contribution to society which is mostly ignored so I th I think there's an imperative that we saw this and I think people we People are beginning to realise that, and there are these seeds of uh, change taking place. I don't know whether anybody's been, been monitoring what sort of effect these, these are having, but I think there are elements of hope if we can harness these shocks um, into, um, into building into building the sort of campaign um, that will lead to greater equality. It's not going to happen quickly. But I, I think it is people begin to wake up to the fact that we can't carry on like this. We can't carry on consuming at huge levels. We can't carry on allowing the rich to, 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 to keep sailing away at the top. Um, and this may require radical change. So, um, Helen, there's a gender aspect to all this as well, isn't there? I mean, uh, dare I say, we've, we've looked at something called the security trap, which is depending on the type of work that you're in, and you, know, you were discussing desk workers and, and Stuart's been talking about precarious work and his key workers and so on. 
you're, you're faced with a series of, of, of difficult choices between work, the ability to um, care and the ability to maintain one's health and the health of, 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 of one's family. And I think these choices are far more uh, acute for, for, for a lot of women. Is there a gender dimension to the inequality debate that, that can come more vociferously to the fore? Yes, absolutely. And I think particularly that comes through with the impact of caring on all of this. And, you know, with all the progress we've made, we actually still see that it is primarily mothers who pay a penalty in the labour market for having children because they are still doing most of the childcare. And it's interesting enough, it's not just about taking time out for maternity leave. The big impact comes because women tend to come back in part time roles. And from that point on, their pay flatlines, whereas fathers hopefully will now be taking more paternity leave, although not enough, but they generally come back into full time work and their pay continues to grow. So that kind of the onus of caring for children is still, you know, very strongly on women. But also, as we've got more and more people living longer and living with multiple health conditions, again, it is still women who are doing mo a lot of the informal caring and it is women who are clustered into the very low paid insecure jobs in the kind of caring industry so i think it is it, it is all still playing out in very gendered lines and actually in kind of less more subtle ways more day-to-day -day ways so one thing when you talk to people in poverty the way that family dynamics work that it is very often uh the women and mothers who are doing the kind of the lifting on how, how do you balance a budget that is not going to go far enough? So even if you've got two parents and they're working and both contributing, of course, it is more likely still to be the woman who is having to manage that household budget and who often acts as the shock absorber for the rest of the family. So women will very often be particularly going without in order so not just kids, but other adults can have what they need. And it, it's amazing, isn't it, with all the changes we've seen, actually, the gendered nature of life, particularly in the kind of that bottom 20 percent, is incredibly strong. And it's women who get stuck in poorly paid work because they need to balance caring with work. And actually, one of the things we need is for the labour market to cease to be organised around the idea of a full time white male healthy employee and to start being organised around the idea of women, disabled people, carers, people from different backgrounds, being able to access decently paid work in a way that currently many people are still shut out of. Thank you, Helen. Um, it feels like we're just getting going, but unfortunately we're also um, starting to run out of time a little. But I just want to ask a sort of final question to you all, because you know the, the conversation we've had today has been uh, wide ranging. You know, we've touched on family, we've touched on work, we've touched on social security, economy, um, the environment, politics. Um, but in terms of inequality, which clearly touches all those areas quite quite deeply and actually Im impairs our ability to respond to the needs of, of each and, and vice versa. What what is the, the what is the thing that gives you the, the most hope looking forward that this agenda will start to move and shift? in quite radical ways, because the way we've been talking about it is that this is not an incrementalist agenda. This requires radical shifts in a whole series of different arenas. Stuart, what gives you most hope, briefly? Well, I mean, I think it's interesting that the levelling up agenda, um, you, know, you know, which is which is the Tory nearest they've got to a big idea, um, although it's pretty insubstantial at uh, the moment, provides a huge opportunity uh, to, to, to debate and discuss and fill in the detail. Uh, I mean, the white paper is going to come out and it's probably going to be pretty thin, but we don't, we don't know for definite. Um, but this is a golden opportunity to, to you know, levelling up is going to be on the agenda and levelling up is about tackling inequality. It's not just about, you know, regional inequality. It's about uh, a whole range of inequality, so maybe that will help. But the, I mean, the other thing is, is I mean, young people. I mean, the impression you get that is that young young people um, are really concerned about this, um, and uh, you know, they're consuming less. They're not buying so many cars. 
um, and, and you know there is there's a there is a sort of hope. Um, they're very you know they're, they're environmentalists. Hope that that you know that that, that maybe a gal you know there may be um, a galvanizing of, of young people may contribute to to, to the form of change. Helen, what gives you most hope? Um, I think actually, as Stuart said, I think it's interesting whether levelling up as a policy agenda will do anything, I think is very much up in the air. But actually, the idea that our national success depends on the changing the fortunes of parts of the country that have been left behind or have not benefited from prosperity, that's a really powerful idea. If we can sustain that as an idea, then I think that could be very powerful. And I think seeing things like, you know, with climate change, it does feel as if we have reached a tipping point, certainly in terms of acceptance of the problem and that we have to do something about it. I don't think we're yet at a tipping point around what solutions we coalesce around. I think there's a lot more po polarisation there. But the fact that that has happened, I think, gives me hope for kind of related social agendas like poverty and inequality. Um, I think the hard part with all of them, though, is getting big tent solutions that enough people can coalesce around to make them stick. I think that's our kind of collective challenge for the next decade. Brilliant. And, and thank you right at the end for bringing in the power of place as part of our conversation. We probably under acknowledge it in this, um, in this conversation, but it's, it's, it's as Chris go alongside a lot of the other things that we've been talking about. Kate, your greatest source of hope. Well, the levelling up agenda also gives me hope and, and young people uh, as well. But I suppose I think what gives me hope are events like this, because as, as Stuart points out in his book, we have had periods in history where we've done better tackling inequality and periods where we just ignored it and where we thought it wasn't important and we thought other things were more important. Um, and a decade ago, people were not talking about inequality. It was not on the political agenda and it's back on. We're having debates like this. People are writing books, people are writing reports, people are discussing it. It's, it's on the agenda. And to me, that's a first step to actually seeing change. So that gives me hope. And I do, I do think we're facing all kinds of tipping points, as others have pointed out. Um, and we need to you know, seize the day and, and just keep pushing and nudging and chipping away. I think we will see change. Brilliant. Well, inequality is, is on the agenda. Very much thanks to our guests today who have done brilliant work over long stretches of time in order to place it in mind analytically, morally and, and politically. So, so thank you all. And, but sadly, that's all we've got time for. So we're going to have to wrap up. And as we mentioned earlier, do check out the links in the YouTube chat and across the RSA social media channels for further reading on any of what's being uh, discussed today. And, you know, thank you all for watching and taking part in the discussion. We're so grateful to have had you to join us. And finally, and most importantly, a huge thanks to our terrific panel, Stuart Lansley, Helen Barnard and Kate Pickett.